Hi everybody, I am Curtis, the Lofty End Scaler, and welcome back to another episode. Today we're going to talk about planning for DCC operation. In particular, planning for computerized DCC operation. So we've decided to build an N-scale layout, and you've got to decide, and I have to decide what kind of operating system I'm going to use to run it. Is it going to be just a DC layout, DCC layout, computerized layout, whatever. I am going to be having a DCC layout, but more importantly, I'm going to have a DCC layout that's controlled by computer. Now, in my mind, which is a vacuumous void, it's going to work like this. The computer is going to be handling most of the passenger operations. It'll be handling the metros, the uh, rail diesel cars, uh, the Amtraks, any specialty trains that come into the station. They will actually be on a schedule. So the set schedule is going to be set and they're going to be running up and down the main line. There'll be sightings to pass. The computer will operate and manage those trains by itself. All the freight and industries where I have to set off and drop cars, any special tourist trains, things like that, are going to be operated manually. But I'm going to have to operate those trains manually within the schedule of the computerized trains. So I'll have to adhere to a schedule, a timetable, etc. Okay, so that's the idea. Now, when we're planning for a computerized controlled layout, um, Mike Pfeiffer had a, had a good, uh, good um, uh, video on dropping lines for Cato Unitrack. And uh, they recommended for DCC every 8 to 10 feet he thought it was sufficient for DCC. Which for a normal DCC layout, that would be correct. So I would probably only drop a feeder wire wherever I thought I needed one, and it wouldn't be that often. However... Since we are going to be computerized, the computer has to know every section of track that's occupied. Now, you can have a three foot long section, you can have a 10 foot long section that's computerized. But let's put some pencil to paper and I'll kind of show you what I'm going to have to do. So, here I have, and I'm trying to keep this centered in my screen here. So, if it goes off, I forgive. Please forgive me. Um, so, let's say I have my station platform here, my track is here, and it's running down here, and I'm gonna go into a switch here. This track is here like this, blah, 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 blah. My drawing really sucks, okay? So here's another track. And um, if you're wondering, this is perfectly to scale, <laughs> not. Okay, so here I have this track, the switch ends here, switch ends here okay so i have these this track and then this track in a computerized layout we have to tell the train that it's it's entering so this one whole track could be one section now if you want the train to stop accurately in other words let's say you want the train to stop on a certain point every single time so when you have the platform here and you may want the locomotive to stop here and then you know the cars to be down here so to keep it from stopping right smack dab in the middle of the platform we need to break this section up so i do it in three sections since this is going to be a metra and it's going to be a push pull type operation so uh you'll have a command cab at one end a locomotive at the other and then you'll have cars in between so when we're talking about like this station platform if I want it to stop in a specific spot, I basically have to tell it. Now, the software I'm going to be using is Railroad and & Company, and it's going to be the Gold Edition, which is their top-of-the-line edition. So if I was going to have a museum layout, this would be perfect for it. Um, I just went ahead and got the top-of-the-line, what the hell, right? So I just got it. Um, and uh, on the software, I can actually measure this platform and give, it a, give the computer a measurement and the measurement and then i can tell it to stop at you know 30 centimeters or something like that whatever uh and 
after some finagling, you can actually get it to work right where it's going to stop on every single point. But uh, you have to have all your locomotives are calibrated and all that good stuff. And for me to start off with, I'm just going to add extra sections. Okay. So for DCC operation, typically you'd only have one feeder wire in that. I'm going to have an insulator joint here and an insulator here so that the switch is going to be insulated from the track. And then I'm going to have one section here and then I'm going to have a second section and then a third section. So when the locomotive decides to hit the third section, I'm going to tell it to slow down and stop. So it should stop pretty much in the same spot every single time. I'll have to finagle a little bit, but that's okay. So what does that mean? Well, I'm going to have to do the same thing with, with this platform over here. Each platform is going to have three sections. So uh, your common ground, your common wire, I'm going to say my black wire, is going to be just one wire for this whole section so this these two rails are going to have one wire and actually these can be connected together okay and so then this is my dcc unit here uh then actually that's that's going to be like my bus like your dcc bus and then over here i'm going to have my detection unit okay so let's say the red wire the positive wire for lack of a better word, uh, is your bus, right? So you have your black, your red. Your black is going to be tied into these two here. And then your red, okay, is going to be, is going to go straight into this, into this bus here. Okay. Now, for the detection unit to detect, what it does is it detects variations in voltage. So when a locomotive enters uh, a powered section of track, there's going to be a voltage drop because it's using electricity. It's going to detect this and then it's going to send a signal back to the computer and then it's going to show that piece of track as occupied. So if you have lights in your cars, uh, you've got um, uh, like the uh, metro system, I'm going to have a decoder in the, in the back car for the control cab so the red and the white lights change appropriately for direction of travel. It'll detect this, okay, so it'll know it. But I have to have a wire from each section. So I'm going to have to have a wire from this section, this section, this section, this section, this one, and this one. Now, the rail has to be cut or insulated from each section. So this will be by itself. There'll be an insulation here, okay, and then an insulated here, and then here, and then here. So I'll have one big long common and then three separate positive three separate positive so then those wires will come down and they will go they will go into this unit okay and then each one will have a corresponding number and don't you just love my schematics so all these six rails will go into my detection unit. The detection unit goes back to my DCC command station, which is plugged into the computer. And uh, this is local net. So this will be, you know, a local net cable goes out and that'll be connected back to uh, the DCC unit. And then that's connected to the computer. The computer will read those as occupied or not occupied. So I'm dropping Probably, well, I would only, typically at DCC, I'd only need two wires for each each track. So I'm adding two extra wires for each track. Um, but you have to think about this when you're planning it, especially with the Cottle track. With the regular like N scale, uh, code 55 or code 80 track, you know, you could just drill a hole. You could solder the wire to the rail, and then you could cut the rail and cut the section. So, and, and theoretically, you could do the same thing with the Cotto stuff, but I want to use the rail joiners underneath the layout and make everything nice and neat and not have to worry about soldering wires to rails. If I have to, I will, but I really don't want to. So, when you're planning your layout, when you're planning your layout, and it's going to be DCC, think about in the future if you ever want it to be computer controlled or not. Since I am alone guy. I'm a lone operator. 
I have no one to play trains with unless one of my grandkids wants to play trains. Um, it, this layout's going to be too big for me to operate. I can't operate more than one train, two trains at the most at any one time. But I want the layout to appear to be busy. So that's why I'm going to let the computer control, you know, the passenger trains, four or five, maybe six passenger trains, and then I'll run the freight to the local industry, pardon me, local industries up and down the track. But that's what's going to be involved. Let's say that uh, I'm going to need a uh, passing and siding. Same principle. So, you know, here I have the track. And I'm just going to do a single line because it's a wavy siding. But I might, for a siding, I might only have two sections. It depends if it's bi-directional or one direction. Let's just say this top track is one direction. In other words, all the northbound traffic is going to stop on this one. All the southbound traffic is going to stop on this platform. I can, only, I can get away with two sections. So I'd have one section there and two sections here. So the train would enter this section and it would be given the command to slow down and then stop here. And then I could do the same thing here. I could do one section, two sections. So it could be given the command as it comes south, command to slow down, and then stop at this, this thing here. And then eventually I want to add signals to this whole thing. So, you know, I'll have a signal there and a signal there. So the, the possibilities are limitless of what you can do with this. But you have to sit there and plan ahead and think ahead as to how you're going to have to wire this. Even if you think that uh, computer control might be something you do in the future, if you're building it from scratch, I would just go ahead and think about the sections of where you want to put wires and go ahead and put them there. And then just leave them tied up underneath if you're not going to use them. I'm going to be using them, though. So that's one thing. Oh, and then a reverse loop. And I'll talk about this in the future. Reverse loops are kind of different because uh, you can only use one detection device for a reverse loop. It can't, it can't detect on something that's outside. So in other words, I'll have my reverse loop uh, reversing uh, electronics here, and I use Tan Valley, and they have um, a double uh, frog juicer, basically, and it can also be used as a reversing unit to, to reverse the polarity of the track when the track hits enter. But let's say I have... My loop here is coming around here. Okay, comes back in. So I'll I'll have it here. So when it hits this, you know, the reversing unit is here. The wires go in here. Uh, my detection unit. Let's say I have several sections here. Okay. So my common ground, of course, will go all the way around. And then let's say the positive one would not go into this it would go into my detection unit. And then wires from these sections would go into the detection unit. You know, if I have a detection unit that has six sections, it'll recognize six or eight sections. If I've got a big loop, put in as many as you want. The last one I had only had one section, so I had to dedicate a $60 stationary decoder for one section that was just long enough for a Chicago Metro train to fit in. I felt like kind of a waste. Uh, the detection units that I use for um, for uh, the, the, the Netherlands that I get from the DigiKeys, those detect, I think, up to 16 sections. So I definitely wouldn't want to use one of the 16-piece units to detect one reverse loop if I didn't have 16 sections to detect. You know, maybe I could put a double main line in there and then I have all these sections to detect that's fine. But um, just keep it in mind. Okay. Thanks for watching. Uh, I am still working. Next time I'm going to, we'll be probably be talking about, I have, I have to get um, my rail joiners and I have to solder leads to them for my detection units. I'm going to go over how I do that with the Cato Unitrack. Uh, it's pretty cool. I saw this, somebody else do this and it was a good idea. So I'm going to copy it. I'm just going to tell you how, how I'm doing it. Uh, Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. Hit the subscribe button and there's a little bell icon next to it. If you click the little bell icon, it'll notify you every time that I post a video. Not that you want to know, but in case you do, it will notify you. And then if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you think any of this was valuable, go ahead and share it to all your friends and family, whether they want to watch it or not. 
But listen, I really appreciate you guys being here, and we'll see you next time.